Well, uh, Richard, Anastasia, thank you so much for joining me here in the spoiler room uh, to talk about your film, Bloody Bridget. I got to see it at the beginning of the month. Uh, I was very excited when I saw that it was going to be at the fest because uh, I knew what kind of ride I was kind of going to be in for because uh, I've seen The Forbidden Zone. <laughs> so I was like, it, this has got to be any level like it was and uh yeah i enjoyed it quite a bit so this this means a lot that you've taken the time to talk to us today about bloody bridget so thank you for thank you thank you for being here hey we're happy to be here man <laughs> oh thanks for having us <laughs> you bet uh so i i've got to ask uh what inspired you to do a a horror musical comedy about a celtic goddess <laughs> Uh, well, it was largely inspired by Anastasia, who is a classical ballet dancer, as well as a, call it like a dark, bloody, burlesque artist. We're talking more David Lynch than Dita Von Teese. Sure. And, and I'm an Afro-Latin percussionist. And when you really get into the music, you get into the Afro-Latin culture, and you actually get into West African folk religions and uh so in real life haitian religious folklore uh the voodoo deity baron samadai you know top hat cigar rum women his wife is a red-haired irish celtic goddess bridget from ireland who they later canonized as saint bridget and that's really going on in haiti right now just like in Jamaica, they kind of deified the former emperor of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie. By the way, his name was Tafari, Ross means king, hence Rastafarian. So anyway, you know, there we go. It's like uh, Samadai is missing his wife, mistakes a red-haired burlesque dancer at some dive bar in Van Nuys, and he restores her power as a Valentine vampire. Well, what is that? Or you shall find out. Uh, drinking blood only whets her appetite. She must eat their beating hearts. Oh. <laughs> I still remember some of the lines. <laughs> uh, and I, I loved that bit. I loved that bit. Uh, <laughs> it, it, the, the bloody Bridget character and, and the Bridget O'Brien character are both fun characters uh, quite a bit. Uh, Anastasia... Uh, I, I can kind of see the appeal, but what drew you to this character that made you want to play her? Uh, well, I I love Rick and his oh, work. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you even said that too. <laughs> so I, I, it was a done deal. <laughs> he knew me, so mm. you know he got past my people. <laughs> No, no, I, well, okay, here's the thing. So uh, being a woman in film, it's like, I want to play really interesting, fun characters. And I find the most interesting and fun characters are in horror. And so we had to make this one a fun and interesting character. And I wanted her to be relatable. I also wanted like her to have like a dual personality and a change. And I'm so happy that people are seeing that effort. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I, yeah, yeah. When she ripped those chests open, it was very poignant. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, you did seem to delight in in that Anastasia. Maybe maybe a little too much, but that's no. There's never too much. Never. Come on, there's too many naughty boys out there. <laughs> there are plenty naughty boys, though a few less after Bridget gets done with them for sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you 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 uh, uh you know you you take the 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 term uh a man eater to a whole new level with with your bloody bridget character so uh <laughs> oh that's right so watch out you guys better all be good or you know yeah she commented after eating the heart of one redneck that his cholesterol was a bit high yeah. maybe that's sudden <laughs> Yeah, these one-liners, Rick just like packed the whole film full of these great one-liners that I love, especially as like the bad guys are like trying to like get out of the situation or like, you know, try to get to uh, 
Bloody Bridget's good side and it doesn't really work out. He sees them for who they are and what they've done. Yeah, like when she killed her teeny boyfriend, who's the doofus now? Yeah. Oscar Wilde, move over. <laughs> <laughs> you you have some you have comedic gold throughout this film, whether it's your one-liners or your music, which is, you know, uh, in your creative works, always seems to be uh, great at the core. And being a soundtrack lover, uh, I love that that you manage to work music. I mean, I I have I don't have it on vinyl, but I do have Forbidden Zone on two different formats oh, here, so. Wow. <laughs> so I don't have it on vinyl yet. I'm 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 hoping to get it, but um actually wait a few months because we're doing the ultimate Forbidden Zone album, including tracks that never made it to the film, early Mystic Nights of the Oingo Boingo stuff, and there'll be a vinyl, but it won't be till later this year. Oh, you just you just warmed my heart, Richard. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you just warmed my my soundtrack heart quite a bit. I can't wait, and I love the soundtrack to this. Uh, now, did you have some of the musical numbers uh, or worked out possibly ahead of time of, of where you wanted it, or did that kind of come after you wrote the initial story? Kind of went along like with writing the script. Everything I do is wall to wall music. Uh, we've got well, well, my brother Danny Elfman, and then our bandmate Ego Plum. An interesting guy, Ernesto Guerrero, East L.A., no musical training like Danny. He does all the music for SpongeBob, the number one cartoon show in the world. Sure. And he just finished a, a feature film for Warner Brothers, Aztec Batman. He's in our band, Mambo Diabolico, by the way. And so he and Danny do all of our scores. Mm -hmm. And then I have a lot of source music. We have a lot of classical pieces Anastasia is a classical cellist. Uh, and uh, God, we've got Oingo Boingo stuff. Dead Man's Party, Ain't It the Life. And then new stuff from Danny's album, Brutal Compensation. And then stuff from our band with Ego, Mambo Diabolico. So it's wall-to-wall -wall music. Yeah, and also some amazing new original Danny Elfman score <laughs> and Ego Plum. It's like, it's it, it's... It's insane for fans. I, I mean, I'm a huge fan myself, so I'm like pinching myself that this is like real and we're getting these like amazing new tunes. And then plus what Ricky said, his uh his new album, Big Mess. So it's like his first album in like, I think it's 30 years or something. Mm -hmm. And so that came out and we're the first ones to use it in anything. So we have a track called Cruel Compensation. And so we've been traveling with the film at different festivals. And a lot of times we'll go along with the film and put on a live pre-show where Ricky uh, taps into local talent and creates a, like a fun band. And then I'll perform to that song, Cruel Compensation, doing a, a live bloody burlesque number where I literally rip a beating heart out of an audience member on stage and eat it. <laughs> <laughs> and on the film play. It's a fun time with us. So we're a low budget film with a multi-million dollar soundtrack. I was going to yeah. say, you've got a, a wonderful soundtrack, and I'm not going to spoil it for folks, but let me tell you, uh, I was so delighted when we get to kind of near the the end, the grand finale, where uh, you get to play, you, you get to make your Alfred Hitchcock moment where you're, you're the devil, and at first you're listening to the dialogue, and you're like, oh, okay, it's kind of got a, and all of a sudden it's got this pentameter, and suddenly it busts into this whole musical number that's just wonderful and the crowd i was in we all laughed and and loved it and i was like i need the soundtrack to the bloody bridget because <laughs> this is I just a do it. Do it. Hmm? okay so so here's some advice to young directors uh if you're in a complete realistic devil outfit you get more respect from the cast and crew <laughs> <laughs> Did, did they challenge you more when you were in the full devil makeup? <laughs> oh, damn your soul to hell! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's lunch. No, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I loved the production design and everything, uh, the look of everything, especially Bloody Bridget. Now, now, who came up with the the look for Bloody Bridget? Because it was a little bit of throwback to almost like an 80s monster 
type look with the big hair and everything. I, I loved the look of her, but uh, who came up with that uh, look? Well, well, Rick came up with the the wig concept. We literally went to like one of the uh, like most well known uh, wig places on Hollywood Boulevard, and we walked in there and we worked with the stylist. And Ricky literally just like drew kind of a stick figure of the type of hair that he wanted and it ended up looking kind of almost like a like a sun i feel like uh yeah. just with all the the points and things like that and so it's actually made of like i don't know like 10 wigs it was really really heavy and we have three of them uh and i think we ended up using two but um but so yeah so rick did the 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 concept for the wig and then i worked with my it was, uh, inspired by wild red hair oh sure <laughs> 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 um i worked, worked closely with my uh makeup people mm -hmm. uh kenneth calhoun and uh jake jake barber and uh, uh work can you at soda effect so we all like worked really closely together and I, I, I have to interject yeah go ahead uh, Anna's background was nights doing drama with Stella Adler and daytime at a practical horror effect shop and that's where we met uh, oh. 13 years ago how how long yeah. ago was it well we've been together 13 years so oh, wow we met 14 years ago. yeah yeah you know but she was uh nights at Stella Adler bloody hands during the day doing horror <laughs> effects yeah so i'm really hands-on with like creating a character and doing like i i i have a lot of opinions on like the costume and the makeup <laughs> and things like that and luckily i had a really wonderful um supportive crew you know that like i mean i was in pretty much every scene so i barely got to sit down i was kind of like get dressed next Next scene, let's go. <laughs> okay, okay, here's a story. I've got to interject. Okay, yeah. so you wouldn't think so, that th this sweet, tender blonde, uh, both her parents were ex-Marines, and she had to go every weekend to young Marine youth camp. Oh. And that plus classical ballet, she's like a samurai, like doesn't complain, you know, like soldiers through. So to save money, okay, so I've got six kills, Normally, I'd have to schlep the practical effects department location to location to location, but we did them all back to back against green screen and then put in fantasy backgrounds. Okay, but what that meant for Anastasia was, okay, tubes taped to her with gorilla tape and all this stuff, breaking her nails off, trying to tear the chest open, eating some piece of shit prop heart, trying not to throw up, the tape ripped off, cold shower, back in, next! <laughs> Six kills, 14 hours, no complaints, darling. What a samurai in a blonde costume. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I yeah, imagine... No, I mean, he's going with a lot of stuff because it was me and he's cute, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I imagine uh, that helped you stay in the character, at least, even with the... Even with the mishaps or whatnot with props you were able to stay in the character instead of jumping back and forth all the time you could just kind of stay into your bridget oh yeah in that one area i was definitely pissed <laughs> <laughs> it was so acting. that was just me pissed with with men no, I'm just joking. <laughs> it was a cold shower oh uh, well it started out as a cold shower but you know that ended up taking too much time so i volunteered to just get the cold bucket oh. rinse off you know <laughs> and it's not just like a one shot thing it's like we have to get up from different angles sometimes like like i don't know with the lawyer kill i'm on my knees uh <laughs> having to hold myself up and like going over so it was a total insane workout and i felt like like it was a very like out of body experience, like dealing with that and trying to like listen to like everybody's notes, like, oh, move your fingers like half a centimeter and then, you know, <laughs> lean in like that. Make sure you don't get the blood up somebody's nose. Like, I'll try. And in my direction, like faster, slower, louder, softer, more emotion, less emotion. Yeah. You know, it's. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, that, that, that's his notes on set. That's, that's his notes on stuff. He just he yells yells out commands to you, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's funny. Like uh, the scene 
I remember vividly the scene with the first kill when I come in uh, with the boyfriend, that dialogue, Ricky had me do it a few times and every time it, the only note was faster and I almost felt like I ended up singing the <laughs> lines and I was like, I hope I remember because I have like severe dyslexia and usually I have like these triggers that I remind myself and it's a certain cadence. So like rushing through it, I was like, Ugh. it just like word vomit at, at <laughs> you know, my scene partner. But luckily, everybody was so supportive, and I had the greatest scene partners and cast. And we, had, we had a great cast and crew. Yeah. We, were, we were very blessed. It, because it, also, like I was saying, I was yeah. in every scene. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it was like a heart, you know, like a heartbreaking scene, then jumping straight into like some cool scene, like at the club. And so I had to really rely on who I was in a scene with to help like carry it through, you know, cause like I'm bouncing around yeah. everywhere. And sometimes we, you know, only have time for a quick rehearsal and that's it, you know, so you gotta be on the ball. <laughs> this was actually the I ever worked with two cameras. So oh, it really? was like radical. <laughs> Thank God we had a great uh, cast, it, you know, that can handle it. And our crew is killer too. Yeah. Well, I mean, that all comes across on screen and it pays off, though, because what you make is definitely a unique and a Richard Elfman film. This is definitely, you know, after I, I watched when I got home, I watched The Forbidden Zone again. And then I recently watched Aliens, Clowns and Geeks. Uh, and what? Then, yeah, what are you? I, I, I watched that and I saw that Anastasia had a number of roles in there. I'm like, oh, and I even recognized the bar. I'm like. Was that the bar for Bloody Bridget? Is that the what? same yeah. bar? Yeah. <laughs> Alien, like, yeah, she played everything from a nun to a floozy in Aliens. A carnival yeah. floozy. Yeah, I yeah, did. Yeah, not just a floozy, but a carnival floozy. There's a big distinction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have a little bit more talent with the carnival aspect of it. You know, you saw the scene. You know what I'm talking oh, about. I, yeah, I, I, I know what you're talking about, which. It's an important scene. <laughs> Which it it made me laugh. It, I I laughed hysterically at that scene. <laughs> Completely, I'm like, okay, and and that's the thing We're that I. There. That's what I love about your films, Richard. Uh, the ones especially where you have the creative control is that its safeties seem to be off. Like you're just you you're just coming up with this stuff, and you're like, I don't care how people are going to receive this. This is what I want to do. And it comes off hilarious. And we like the, the 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 acrobatic scene, the talented scene in in Alien Clouds and Geeks, or you know, is some of the humor in Bloody Bridget. While not offensive, it still is. You go to places that are unexpected. I think that you don't see nowadays. Uh, is there anything that when you're writing, you go, maybe I shouldn't put it in, or do you just write what you want to do and you go for it? Well, I, I have a very uh, structured writing technique mm -hmm. is I have a, a rooftop garret kind of overlooking the Hollywood Hills. It's an old Hollywood house, actually with some tradition. John Lennon actually wrote some music in the little garret. Oh, nice. And so what I do is I lock myself in with a case of Johnny Walker Black and a box of cigars. And three weeks later, I come out with a script. Really? <laughs> That's how you wrote it? <laughs> Yeah, but, but okay, I've got to say, uh, I, I'm also I've been a lifetime journalist. Now I'm a novelist. I'm sure, the son sure. of a, I'm the son of an English teacher who published 16 novels, two Emmys, post age 50. As crazy as the films are, they're grounded with a classic three act story structure. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it, and in it, terms it, of character development and whatever, mm -hmm. it, 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 they're not as dumb as they look. Just like me. It, well, <laughs> that, I, I wasn't going to say that comparison, but I will say that that's what I also enjoy about the films are the fact of as wild and crazy as they are on the surface, if you're paying attention to the film, it's a film. It's not just a bunch of series of gimmicks. We don't just have Anastasia ripping the hearts out of people at random. There, there's motivation here. There's there's. Her character has an arc. There, there's, there's, you know, there's other characters that you work in that are there not just as a one-note character or a gimmick. I mean, our lawyers, 
that you end up pairing up with who I loved, you know, they show up multiple times. They don't just aren't one-off characters. You can tell here in in Forbidden Zone and in, you know, Aliens, Clowns, and Geeks, there's a story here. These are more than just ridiculous situations. You actually have a narrative in here, and that's what I love is how wild they can be, yet you still keep that structure. Uh, and I think well, that... Well, dis- I, I have to interject. My hmm. the religion wasn't so much secular Judaism, mm-hmm. but was character development and story structure. Right, yeah. I mean, it, you worked it in there, and it actually it made sense why they were there. That's what I liked about it, too. I'm like, wait, we, we now have a priest in here with the... And I'm like, oh, okay, and they're more than just doing one-liner jokes, they actually serve a purpose near the end of the film when you're, you're well, facing... drives the story forward and mm-hmm. culminates. When you see Billy Bridget 2, we're working on the script right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited for that. I'm very excited for that. And, okay, and our, the... our, our lawyers, Daniel Dershowitz and Daniel Dershowitz Jr., uh, Brooklyn Jews, they're both little people, uh, Yarmulkes. Okay, so the we've got our... our, our Bloody Bridget, we've got Pepe, Sam and I joins in. We've got a threesome, the devil's watching on his computer down below. Gets jealous, shows up for a very painful foursome. And he makes the little Jewish little people lawyers go to Ireland and infiltrate the leprechauns to get a document. <laughs> oh, they're never going to believe it. Put the damn hat on and cover the yarmulke. You saw <laughs> Yes, oh, I mean, a lot of culture going at Bloody Bridget too. <laughs> oh, you're already making me that's, want it. That's where you thought it would naturally go. Well, it's yeah. basically that's the vibe that we're going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I, you know, and I, I, I think, I, I think the best, the best comedies, the best comedy horror, the best movies like this are the ones that have the structure yet. Ha- you're having so much fun. It look all three of your films, Richard. You you look like you're having so much fun. And Anastasia, any role you I see you in, you seem to be having a blast. Whether it's here or Brides of Satan or even in the short film in Shevenge, oh, which I have it's here. It's film. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we shot that here in our house. Oh, did you really? <laughs> yeah. That was probably one of my more serious roles. <laughs> it, it was a little more serious, but you look like you look like you're having fun. How do you how do you maintain that energy, especially when you have, you know, Richard directed you? I mean, you hear kind of horror stories about relationships when husband and Wait, wives. Are horror stories about Richard? No, 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 no. About other couples when they work together, how that you know can strain some amazingly, things. Amazingly, we don't fight. Uh, and we, we actually have fun working together. It, it's actually, I, I thank God, it, you know, it's like this dream, uh, you know, and she's my, my star, but, but we have fun. The crew has fun. We don't pay shit, but I cook at the end of every week. I, I'm a barbecue master, cases of wine, boxes of cigars, 12 pound salmons, whole lambs turning on the spit. So the, the crew has fun. It's, it's a party. And uh... <laughs> well, here's the secret is that he listens to everything I say. So I'm just always right. And that's, <laughs> that's the key, right? So if I'm right, what? there's nothing wrong. <laughs> yes, yes. See? Yes. Yeah. I could, I could totally relate. My wife is, is the same way. She's, she's always right as well. And it's, it's, yes, dear. It's better for everyone. (laughs) Domestic tranquility works out a lot better that way. (laughs) No, I I mean, to, to get to your question, I think for me personally, it's like, I choose to work with people that I love as friends and I love their art. I love what they do. And I work with a lot of the same directors like Stacey. I've worked with a lot. I, I work with Michael and Sophia um, Epstein a lot. Uh, Drew Marvick, I work with a lot. Um, I have a good he... Drew Marvick story. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Tell me. <laughs> okay. Okay. So he does lives in Las Vegas, does slashers. She was in, a, what was that 
thing you did with, with Drew? Overkill. Yeah, she's mm -hmm. about to star in his next film. Okay, so we we book, a, I get some discount at the fancy posh Bellagio Hotel, and then she come every night back from shooting three in the morning dripping with blood, and I had to rush her to the elevator through and get her into the room with people staring. So <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of like like the security both like we're kind of curious like should we help you ma'am or like, like like we don't really need to see you right now like this blonde lady like we don't want to get involved <laughs> i'm like like trying to get my like key out you know like well, well, everything well, well, served the joys of being married to a, a screen screen queen <laughs> yeah. well and it, and, it, and it's vegas they're like whatever happens in vegas she's not coming to us so we're not going to go to her if she's okay you know exactly if, that was kind of the vibe like <laughs> maybe if i started screaming they would have maybe looked up but i could tell you know when somebody's like trying to ignore you you could tell that they know you're there but they just didn't want to get involved yeah <laughs> Uh, it's great. That's great. <laughs> it, what is it about horror Anastasia that that you love? Because you seem to be just a huge fan of it. What is it about horror that you enjoy? Well, okay. I don't know if you're ready. We don't have enough time, but I'm a huge like monster kid, horror freak. I grew up on all like the classics, I'm talking like silent film, pre-code horror, film noirs, all like all the horror classics, uh, like, ugh, like gateway horror, everything. So I'm just totally obsessed. My religion is cinema, you know, so I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> like, I've just always been obsessed with horror. It's, it's starts... very structured secular Judaism. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Let's chime in. Tell them about my history. <laughs> I, the writer. It's okay. Uh, but, you know, and Richard, with these, these wild ideas and everything that you come up with, you work in the music. Uh, everything it just feels like it's it's you with these three films you you have creative control at least with the the forbidden zone uh alien clowns and geeks and this one correct were those the only films you really had other films, hmm? but, but these are the three that i had creative control on right i'm most proud of and uh I, i'm only doing stuff at this point that i i have creative control I, I was going to ask that because I know you've done other projects as well, and I, I've seen those, but those don't exactly have that Richard Elfman energy that these three films for sure have, and, and your future films I'm sure will have as well. And, you know, uh, what, what inspires you that, uh, you know, what inspired you to, to get into the filmmaking business and, and the imagination you have, uh, you know, do you have any specific influences or is it multiple sources? I don't know. My, my background is, is music, Afro-Latin percussion. Right. Uh, I've had like kind of an odd, I, I mean, I grew up born in Watts, raised in Crenshaw. So I was like the only white kid. Uh, and then, God, I'm in an Afro-Latin group. <laughs> I'm working with this group, the, the Coquettes, that's C-O-C-K. Uh, <laughs> kind of a drag, you know, doing, putting up old musicals. And then I'm 21 in Paris in a theater company that has like a hit show and it's kind of absurdist comedy with music. I got my brother over, got him in the first music he ever played. And then I, I wanted to create my own theater group, the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo. And uh, Forbidden Zone was largely our stage show. Mm. That was kind of the evolution. You know, so it is what it is. <laughs> well, I just it. I, I always love uh, cre talking to creative folks like yourself and, and seeing where those ideas come from because I think we're so used to seeing "quote unquote" normal or you know mainstream ideas, and to see such creativity out there yet it gives me hope for indie films. Uh, you know, the yeah, music. I'm not worried about AI. Huh? I'm not worried about AI. <laughs> <laughs> and you know I, and i love the music you even have i saw 
because you were trying to do uh, Forbidden Zone 2, and I saw your clip on your YouTube channel where you had the radioactive chicken heads. Were those the guys that were on stage in Bloody Bridget as well? Because the masks looked the same. Yes, that's uh, our friends, the radioactive chicken heads. Uh, Anna and I have been in three of their videos. Oh, nice. <laughs> because, yeah, we love them. Yeah. Because th they were wild, yet they seemed to fit into the world uh, that you, you created, which uh, I, I also enjoy the fact that you have these elements in here, but the world you build, it all fits. Even as crazy and outrageous as the visual might be, it fits. And you open your film, Bloody Bridget, with this wonderful, uh, look like, were those uh, uh, storyboards or the art that you opened with? Where did that come from? Brilliant artist Martin Simmons from London. Uh, he does top covers for DC and Marvel. Mm. Very lucky to get people to come in and help. Be yeah, yeah, this guy's off the charts. They, they looked wonderful. And then we get the wonderful interpretive dance number that we have in here <laughs> that Anastasia is a part of. Anastasia, did you do the choreograph for that then? I did a little portion. We had a wonderful uh, choreographer, Lennon um, Hobson, Hobson <laughs> a blonde moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, she did a majority of that, but like she worked really closely with Rick and I, and, mm -hmm. and it was kind of like I was doing so much on the film, I had to mm. like let go a little bit of the things that I usually control. Like in Aliens, Clowns, and Geeks, I did all the choreography for those different numbers that you see throughout the scene. And actually, I was like one of the the girls right. in like a, a little black bobs. So yeah, she has her blonde on my senior Jewish redhead clown moments. <laughs> I was gonna. <laughs> I was gonna ask if you had done the stuff for Aliens and Clowns because uh, when I saw that in there and I knew uh, you had the background in dance, I'm like, oh, I wonder if she did that. So that was great that you got a chance to do the choreography for that one. And and I love the opening for this with the dance number too. It it set the tone for everything, and it was it was very fitting for this this wonderful horror comedy. Uh, I, I it was great to see in an audience too. Uh, you know, as much as everybody likes watching stuff at streaming, it was fun because we were all laughing at the same time. And it always feels good when you're sitting in an audience and you're not the only one laughing. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been so much fun because, like, unfortunately, we weren't able to be there with your screening. But usually we go and we'll do the the, the pre-show stuff and we'll sit and we'll watch the film with everybody and then the Q&A after. And it's been so much fun. Like, people are having a blast. It's really fun to watch with the crowd. We've actually been everywhere from Canada to Brazil, believe it or not. Wow, Brazil even, huh? <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, that was, that, that was wild. Uh, but by the way... Uh, she was mobbed after the show by women as well as men. Really? <laughs> you know, like, oh, you should kill my boyfriend like that. He deserves it all. You know? They love the character. <laughs> and, and as much as I love like Canada, as a professional percussionist, I found better drummers in Brazil. Ah, well, no. that makes and they're, they're a very quiet audience too. It was a little easier to do live burlesque with the with oh, sure. in Brazil, like really loud mm -hmm. audience, you know. And and you did feature. Uh, you have had a chance to feature your uh, the the band uh, the Diabol uh, Mambo Diabolical. Uh, it, it, you featured them. I noticed at the ends of Aliens, Clowns, and Geeks, and then. I think they were, were they at the end of uh, Bloody Bridget as well, the music uh, during the yeah, credits? Yeah, Grab everyone we're related to and throw it in. Yeah, it, <laughs> I, and I love that song. Oh, it's a band. <laughs> I love that song too. Uh, it, it just, you know, the music and everything just gels together with this. The music, lead hmm? singer, Lena has five octaves. Yeah. I, yeah, I we don't yeah, the whole band is killer. Steve, yeah, 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 Aaron, yeah, 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 yeah. Alan. Yeah, yeah, we're, all, we're all seasoned musical pros. And, and you can tell, too, because uh, the music is, is solid. And as, as unusual as it might be to some people's ears, I, I love it. Because, again, just like your films, 
it has structure. There's, 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 there's a, 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 you know, a cadence to it. There's a feeling that you get from it. And I, I'm a big music geek. I used to play music in high school. So, uh, alto, uh, alto saxophone. So, um, Be careful, we'll, we'll hook you up like the next time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't played for a number of years, but when you're talking about your barbecue, Go on. <laughs> when you talk about your barbecue, that makes me want to come out and live in my car and be an extra on your movie or whatever, just because I, I love barbecue. Uh <laughs> you have no idea. I, I gotta say, I'm a grill master. I've been doing this for I don't know how long. I, I years ago I was a food and wine journalist that's kind of what got me started working with restaurant tours oh nice and, and you yeah. even have do you still have the the food and wine what is it the food and wines performance salon it's called the barbecue bacchanals it's an underground event our house can only hold 80 people and we don't publicize it oh it's I'm a so very hot ticket yeah <laughs> yeah 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 we're uh, anna does incredible bloody burlesque on the roof with her musical partner morgan sorn who you can't even describe it it's so wild <laughs> and and i I'm, uh but it's it's an underground event oh it's underground it's sorry underground. It, it it was on on <laughs> imdb though but well sorry i did we'll we'll just bleep it out yeah, we'll just put it bleep. Oh, like people put stuff on yeah, i don't know i don't know <laughs> Was it was your dad's partner the one who was uh, uh, playing your uh, partner in the burlesque show in Bloody Bridget or uh, the the mute? Oh, Marcos. Marcos, uh, yes. Yeah, he, yeah, he um he was actually in both films. He was also right. he played like a cabaret dancer yeah. in Aliens Heats, and now he plays Pepe, uh, Bridget's like best friend. Uh, and kind of like sidekick into like the murder that she does. <laughs> um, so yeah, she uh, he he's sometimes my dance partner out of film, like for the the Mambo Diabolico stuff. We've done a few things like that. He's, but, he's a professional dancer as well. Yeah, mm. yeah, and he's done a lot of amazing stuff on his own. But uh, the partner that he's talking about, Morgan Sorn, he's a, a, a intense crazy talented singer who also has like five octave range and he records and harmonizes uh himself and creates these like dream kind of like soundscapes and we do this show called uh vengeful ways which is a few uh selected songs from uh, a couple of he has like these operas and they're very dark and uh tortured kind of souls and so it, it like usually I do like comedy burlesque sure. and this is something very different which is like very like tortured and tragic <laughs> and I change characters in front of people's eyes so I'll like play three different characters throughout the like you know mm -hmm. 20 minute set so it's wow. it's a it's a crazy time <laughs> wow, and I'm expecting from people who know like <laughs> my my work because it usually lends more like a, a i love lucy kind of comedy or like laurel and hardy or three street you know like i do more of that kind of stuff L little more <laughs> With slap, my balloon. little little more slapstick yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, with my uh, my newer number that I'm, we've been touring with, my Bloody Bridget burlesque number, um, I kind of take the audience from like happy, silly, goofy, and then it kind of turns surreal and then very intense and sanity. You know, like when I'm like disemboweling somebody and eating their heart. So I just really wanted that arc. <laughs> I wanted the audience to see my range. You know, I can do everything. I can pop balloons, and I can also take your rip your heart out. You know. <laughs> Uh, it, one of the things I, I noticed in here now, it's not exactly for the people who may be uh, a little bit squeamish with nudity. I, I wanted to ask you, Richard, uh, in your films, uh, at least the, the three I've mentioned, uh, you seem to handle the uh, more intimate scenes with a lot of comedic flair. Uh, is, is that on you know, purpose and, and, and kind of what's the motivation for that? <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe I never grew up. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. I like that. <laughs> uh, and um, 
I guess uh, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I do have a, a question I always like to ask. Uh, was there a scene, and, and this could be for both of you, was there a scene or a particular thing that you read on paper, you're like, oh, man, this is going to be so hard to do. And then when you got to doing it, it came off, like, real easy, like, wow, we just nailed it, like, right away. Was there any scene like that in, in Bloody Bridget? Well, for me, the, the hardest scene was I had to do a love scene with Bridget and Baron Samadai. So the guy playing Samadai, Jean Charles, complete gentleman, actually from Haiti, but he's a fucking male model, six foot two Adonis. Uh, <laughs> total gentleman, though. Okay, it's so when we're having like our meeting, he's asking me about, well, you know, will there be like an intimacy coordinator? It, you know, he was very concerned. And I said, are you fucking kidding? It's my goddamn fault. There's going to be kryptonite between you two. That was the fastest scene I shot in the film. It was like the camera did one sweep. But next, <laughs> fuck that. <laughs> Well, I hate to tell you, but with that scene, we're on a freezing green screen, overlit soundstage. It was not, there was like no romantic vibe. Yeah, you know what I mean? So many people yeah, around. Yeah. Like it was, <laughs> but also to be fair, I didn't write it. Yeah, so, that's true. Yeah. For my problem, you know, like. <laughs> But yeah, and then for the other scenes, I don't even know if I had a chance to like introduce myself. We we got in and out of those things so fast. This was the fastest I've ever shot. <laughs> like fastest literally. Ever shot. Yeah. It was awesome. If you think fast, just crank it up to like a million. That's how let's like he's not he doesn't play around. But also like we both come from the stage. I don't I'll do it, but I don't love waiting you know yeah. for like every like to do i don't know like i just want like the instant gratification kind of stuff that i get from my you know like stage work oh, okay. so i like working fast is oh, basically oh. it here's the beauty of digital because i came from all 35 millimeter frames mm -hmm. to the last two but uh it gives you uh i would tell young directors always get a second camera it's cheap and it's going to save you money in the long run. But here's what it gave me, and actors love it, is I'd get my take that I knew I had it, and I'd tell them, okay, we've got it. Now we're going to do one more, do anything the fuck you want. <laughs> and I'd often get my best performance that way. But I could only do that with digital, not with 35 millimeter. Right. Uh, but, but anyway, shoot with two cameras. Yeah, which, which is great, like you said, for an actor, because it's like you're – you're workshopping these things and sometimes it doesn't, when you get to set, it doesn't really work mm -hmm. the way that you intended it to work. So you got to like be able to like roll with the punches and stuff. And then sometimes you want to take a, you want to make a hot choice and take a risk. And with having that extra like take or two that don't like, there's nothing at stake. You just get to play, you know, like sometimes there's something golden there that like, you know, that you would worry risking the time of everybody if you didn't have that and, that makes sense and, and i've worked with the same dp howard wexler he's a master we've been together 25 years so we think alike mm. and, and can go in and, and roll with the punches because particularly on a low budget film something happened like a set doesn't show up something happens something's different but I, i'm also a stage director you know so we can choreograph stage howard's moving the camera Bang, uh, and, and the actors like less waiting. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, we it, did. Well, I <laughs> <laughs> and you're not doing 157 takes or whatnot to get it right, correct? Because you don't have yeah, to. Because yeah. you've oh, got God. the coverage. You've got the coverage, and uh, yeah. it, it, and plus you don't have a whole lot of time with indie cinema. I, I've talked with my friends about it and how digital is the double-edged sword. While one hand you can do a lot of creative things. On the other hand, the big studios seem to realize, well, we can just take our time and just, we don't have to worry about the cost of film because it's digital cheap. But at the same time, I don't think as much care is put into those big budget films as they are with indie films like yours, because you're working on a time crunch and limited budget. And they just are like, well, digital's cheap. So we can just keep shooting up until the week before the movie's released. And, and no. you know, here, here's the thing. It's uh 
200 million notwithstanding, they often don't understand story structure and have to spend tens of millions after the fact where if someone understood that, including the directors, mm -hmm. they could have saved it before they started shooting. But anyway, that's my mother talking to the English <laughs> teacher. <laughs> Well, I mean, the structure comes through on your films, but also the entertainment and the energy, and it talks to my inner freak, uh, and and I really dig the films. And Bloody Bridget, folks, if you got a chance to see it, uh, you know, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, and I guess the final question I have is, if there's one thing you'd like people to get out of uh, Bloody Bridget, uh, what would that be? To have fun. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> well it is fun uh and it's not just me saying it because you're here i i had a blast the audience we saw it with had a blast it sounds like everywhere where you're showing it is a lot of fun uh so where could they keep up with where bloody bridget is showing next i guess watch us on facebook we're just re-putting up a web page mm. uh we, we own the film we had no partners or investors or anything like that mortgage credit cards but uh, so we're just having fun with festivals and deciding what we're going to do with distribution. I I'm actually uh, doing um, animation right now. Oh, nice. Uh, uh, yeah, so I've got some interesting horror animation, horror comedies coming up. But, uh, you know, we're just kind of taking our time with this and having fun with festivals. Uh, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, and... and on, on, by, by the way, we've, we've won 20 festivals so far. Uh, well yeah, deserved. Now, uh, so Bloody Bridget was totally self-financed, so there's no suits, and it's a completely unadulterated uh, Richard Elfman original. So just like what you were saying, like that's like nobody was telling him no, except maybe me once in a while. But <laughs> <laughs> like, he was allowed to go as zany and wild and as Richard Elfman esque as he wanted to be. And, you know, it definitely shows. And then also I wanted to say uh, to your point earlier that, you know, sometimes the audience isn't um, used to seeing like what's in the film. We kind of, I mean, everything's like a bit PC now in the culture, but we let the bad guys actually be bad guys so that the audience is rooting for their demise. And so that's what, like, I, I, I was looking at your review and everything, and I, I just love that you saw those little nuanced things that we were trying to convey. And, you know, so thanks so much for supporting that. <laughs> Mentioning it, it really it wonderful for us. <laughs> I, I'm just watching a lot of it's why I fell in love with indie films, because like I said, your safety's off you when you have full creative control, you're taking chances. And I think uh, that's refreshing. I think it's it, it shows originality. And yeah, just keep doing what you're doing, folks, because uh, uh, you got at least one person there. Uh, and if you ever release a Bloody Bridget soundtrack, uh, uh, you have my money already. So uh, oh, definitely. That's it. <laughs> It's, well, right now we're doing the Forbidden Zone reissue. And right. We'll do Bloody Bridget next. Oh, I'll, I'll definitely keep my eyes peeled for it. So, folks, yes, check out Bloody Bridget and check out Anastasia and Richard Elfman's work. Uh, Anastasia, what do you got next? Elf, uh, Richard said he's got the animation. Do you have anything coming up on deck? We're doing Drew's slasher. Right? Yeah, well, I don't know if I'm supposed to say that. I've got oh, a slasher sure. coming up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And then we're we're writing a, a horror film together that mm -hmm. I'll be directing and probably starring in. So so and and you know like I I work on Ricky's like adult animation stuff like the projects and things like that. So I mean plus I mean we're doing the film festival circuit yeah. and we're doing it all of ourselves. So it's like <laughs> when we do these live performances, it's like we 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 both co-produce these. We do we handle every aspect from the themed Burlesque cocktails music. <laughs> yeah, from the themed cocktails in the lobby to the lobby music, you know, when people are coming sure. in. So every aspect, it's, it's it's like, you know, come and hang out at our place kind of vibe, you know, like we've got our like control of all of that kind of stuff. So it's like, it's, we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes. <laughs> and then we also tour with Forbidden Zone. Uh, we tour around with that. And so that's special for audiences because we do 
the uh, a, spe a different special live pre-show for that. And most of his uh, fans, you know, came across Forbidden Zone from some probably a bootleg copy in somebody's basement or in like a VHS store. And and they're like somebody's attic, you know, who knows? It's been so wild, like history with that. Uh, and so now people can, uh, you know, like book it and they can watch it on the big screen, which is so special. Right. Uh, you know, like the audience has like such a wonderful experience there. And I, I get on stage and shadow cast a couple numbers. Yeah. Oh, nice. Devil yeah. the Moocher and then the, the Yiddish of Charleston. Yeah, oh, nice. it's like a really <laughs> special event that we're like, yeah, I, yeah. I'm trying to get the word out there that, you know, like we're, we like touring with that kind of stuff. You know, because like I'm a huge fan of Forbidden Zone and I want other people to be able to experience that. It's like a very immersive experience that we create for them, you know. So it's fun. Very that, voice of, very <laughs> well, that's amazing. You give people that theatrical experience because I think that's uh, lacking uh, in a lot of places. And that's that's kind of a more old fashioned showmanship that you have from start to finish with your, your film. And I think that gives it a unique identity and something that people will remember a lot longer than your latest tentpole big budget film. I think it'll definitely have a lasting impression on people. So uh, thank you, Anastasia. Thank you, Richard, so much. This has been a pleasure. Uh, I'll put links to everything in the body of this podcast for where you can find their stuff. And yeah, folks, check it out. Check out uh, uh, Aliens, Clowns, and Geeks and uh, Forbidden Zone are on Tubi for you to see. Uh, and experience. And while you should be experiencing it in the theater, next best thing, get a group of friends together and watch it because you've got a creative powerhouse in these two folks. And uh, yeah, keep making the original stuff because there's people out there that'll watch it for sure. Yeah, and there's uh, like special edition Blu-rays available too for any like physical media freaks out there like us. And maybe <laughs> like you, right? <laughs> hey, thank you so much. <laughs>